Hello, everyone, and welcome to ACP's live remote non-C offering. My name is Dan Calvo, and I'll be today's moderator. I would like now to introduce my colleague and friend, Todd Stefanilla, who will be our presenter today. Todd is a physical therapist and clinical program consultant with ACP. Todd, it's all yours. Well, thank you so much, Dan, and thank you um, to everybody in attendance today. Um, hopefully, along the way, we're going to have some fun. Um, I'll introduce my lab assistant back here. That's Joe. Um, he's generally the star of the show, uh, but so um, a couple things before we start uh, that I'll touch on um, in the fact that we're going to look at some skilled interventions for impaired balance today. So um, in general, impaired balance is one of the is a fall risk um, factor uh, as we look at patients who are fallers or at risk to fall. Um, Impaired balance just being one fall risk. So it's important to take a look at that, just like it is to take a look at the rest of the risk factors, whether it's uh, pain, postural issues, urinary incontinence. There are many, many fall risk factors, impaired balance being one of them. Um, and if we find that someone does have impaired balance, we need to have some um, specific um, interventions to treat that. So prior to uh, working with your patients to remedy their impaired balance, we need to identify uh, what it is about their balance that is impaired. Um, I particularly like to use a test called modified CATSEB or a clinical test for sensory integration of balance um, for one simple fact. When we talk about balance um, in humans, there is a system of input, which is sensory information, whether it's visual, vestibular, or somatosensory, then there is a uh, place, your brain, where that information is processed and, that, and your brain is responsible to choose uh, the, the most correct sensory information. And then it, just like a computer, it kind of spits out an output. That output are our postural um, correction strategies. Um, it is how much force we use to make a correction, how much muscle length we use to make a correction. So this whole system works together, but we have to first take a look at those, those sensory, um, sensory pathways or sensory tools that we have available to, that help us maintain our balance. So <clears throat> once you take a look at that and you identify certain areas that have impairments, whether it's on the input side with either use of that or integration of that sensory information, whether it's a problem on the processing side, maybe they've had a CBA and they have some Im impairment um, in brain function, or whether it's an impairment on the motor output side. Do they have the strength to perform a, a corrective strategy? Do they have the appropriate range of motion to perform ADLs a certain way so they're not substituting and putting themselves at risk for falls? All those areas can then be, uh, accumulated into creating a, a nice uh, plan of care and treatment interventions. As we know, falling is multifactorial. It's usually more than one area, more than one thing, but treatment for that is always gonna be impairment based. So we have to kind of peel back the onion to figure out what's happening. Um, <clears throat> and once we have these impairments identified, then we can attack them, specifically with the OmniStand, which is what we're gonna get up and start doing here pretty quick, but the OmniStand, uh, it's a fall proof design. Uh, it's going to give the patient and the clinician that extra sense of confidence that they can kind of push themselves toward their limits of stability or beyond those limits of stability in order to uh, fully challenge that patient in some real life scenarios. <clears throat> um, they're going to challenge them to utilize their balance strategies, uh, whether it's an ankle strategy, hip strategy, or a stepping strategy. It can also lend itself, the understand can also lend itself to working the other impairments. You can do strengthening exercises. You can work on gait. Um, if it's a sensory information side, we're gonna change the support surfaces. We're gonna vary the visual um, abilities of the patient, eyes open, eyes closed. Um, so there are a lot of factors that go into balance retraining, um, but not the least of which is identifying the impairments that are specific to the patient. Having specific impairments to attack 
are, is much more important than just generalized balance activities. The more specific we can be, the better our training and the better our outcomes are. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. So we talked a little bit about um, what we need to look at. Balance is literally just um, someone's desire to maintain their center of mass or center of gravity over a given base of support, whether that is in static standing or walking. Even as we're walking, it's just a moving base of support, a dynamic base of support. And our goal is always to maintain that center of mass over top of that base of support. We have different strategies and different postural control techniques that are used to right, cor correct any movement that brings that center of mass outside of that base of support. So a couple of things that we use are our, our equilibrium reactions, our writing reactions, right? Those things are all more reflexive and reactionary and are integrated as we grow. The things that we can really facilitate as clinicians are the balance strategies an ankle strategy, a hip strategy, and a stepping strategy. And we'll talk about those a little bit more in just a second. But as we're standing quietly and trying to maintain balance, we all also have this ability, this, this imaginary cone called our limits of stability. It allows us to move that center of mass over and outside a little bit of that base of support prior to having to make some kind of a reaction to keep our equilibrium, keep our balance. So normal limits of stability are eight degrees laterally, eight degrees anteriorly, and approximately four to six degrees posteriorly, right? So we have to be able to move within this cone of stability. And that's the, initially where we want to start if someone's lower level, we'll kind of focus on some lower level um, strategies first and then progress it all the way up to some pretty high level activities. Um, but a lot of times in skilled nursing, long-term care, uh, we're seeing folks that are a little bit lower level. So we'll try to keep that in mind as we go through. Um, so a good place to start if they have problems just in quiet standing, if you notice that they're having excessive sway just in standing on a firm surface, that could mean that they have decreased ankle strength, very common. Right, so we know that one thing that increases sway and very common in skilled nursing home fallers is decreased anterior tib strength. If that's the case, when they start to go backwards, remember, remember there's already not a very much excursion going backwards. If they don't have the strength in that anterior tip to pull themselves back forward, that's going to lend itself to a backwards fall. Okay, so we can kind of get an idea just in standing of their ability to use that ankle strategy since that's the most commonly used strategy uh, in quiet standing very low it, it, it compensates for very low force perturbations perturbation just being something that's trying to knock us outside our, our base of support um, it's the most commonly used strategy the next strategy is a hip strategy which we'll be demonstrating these along the way um, hip strategy is a little bit higher force perturbations that's what we activate at the hips to maintain or bring ourselves back, center of mass back over a base of support. We've all felt that before, either standing on a bus and the bus goes to take off and we get this uh, hip moment that happens. That's us using a hip strategy, trying to maintain our balance. We've also felt it in the past when we just, anybody that's stood on a log or a balance beam, you can start to feel that motion coming from the hip. That's your hip strategy. The last strategy that we have available when all else fails, you may use the ankle and the hip strategy independently of each other. Oftentimes you'll use those together at the same time in conjunction with each other. But if those two strategies fail to keep us over our base of support, the next and last thing we have is called the stepping strategy. That's where we take that step forward, okay, or backward. So a stepping strategy is kind of the last thing before we then take a fall. And that's when our equilibrium reactions and writing reactions and protective responses come in uh, into play. So all of those things we use depending on the speed at which something happens and the force at which something happens to knock our center of mass outside of our base of support. As clinicians, we can really emphasize that ankle, hip, and stepping strategies uh, in practice, we can help to facilitate those. And typically when you do those things, you want to start out 
with uh, telling the patient what you're going to do and have them expect it. So it's an expected reaction. But then over time, you want to progress that to its, uh, until it's more reactionary and you want to kind of surprise them with it. They still know what you're attempting to do, but you're not going to give them as much as many cues as far as direction or force. Um, you want to see how the how they're going to institute that strategy all by themselves. So inside an Omni stand, if you have one, maybe you're looking for some more treatment ideas. If you don't have one, maybe you're looking to see will it benefit our patients in our clinic. This is kind of undressed right now. There are other support mechanisms, and I'm going to put those in place um, after I show you some of the strategies. Actually, I'm going to put the knee pad in place now. So for your lower level patients, you have the harness set up. He's in there good and snug. You can move the hip stabilizer bars in and out. The abdominal pad is above the belly button. There's a seat on the harness. So he's fully supported right now. It looks kind of like a standing frame. All the brakes can be engaged so the equipment doesn't move. All the brakes are engaged right now. So this looks very much like a standing frame, but pretty soon you're gonna see it's not that at all. Um, because it's gonna allow us to challenge that patient within and beyond their normal limits of stability because of the sway function that's on here, the dynamic nature of this uh, tool. So I'm gonna increase, I'm gonna activate the sway mechanism. We have six degrees or 11 degrees. So remember normal limits of stability are eight and four degrees. So we can challenge this patient um, to work beyond normal limits of stability or, and depending on their level. And we'll go back to static. So if someone's very low level, we can start them out in the static function. If someone's a little bit higher level, they're going to start, they can start out at six or 11 degrees of freedom. And so Joe, what I want you to do is just bring yourself around in a full circle. Let's show them how the omni stand moves. So Degrees of freedom in all ranges. He can move himself. And if you take note, as he goes backwards, you can see what's happening. His toes are coming up. He's activating that ankle strategy just by doing some static weight shifting. He's not moving anywhere. He's securing the device. I'm hands-free. And Joe is actually just demonstrating the amount of freedom that the Omni stand gives. And within that, he was moving actually past normal limits of stability, uh, which if we're trying to train someone, we want to push them towards their max limit and beyond if we can, which oftentimes is difficult if you're just a clinician, don't have an extra set of hands. We always tend to have this fear that something's going to happen to the patient. So I don't think that we push them enough to fully retrain balance. Um, but when they're in something like the Omni stand, we have that capability. So Joe is a little higher level. You saw him, that's full degrees of freedom. We're gonna put it back in static. So he's not moving. One of the accessories of the Omni stand is the knee pad here. It's easy on, easy off. You can change these things on the fly during treatment. It's very easy to change. So you can have, use it for different applications. Let's assume Joe is a little, a little bit lower level patient, and he needs that extra support at his knees so he can remain in standing. So although we're providing extra contact, we're going to cue him to stand up nice and tall if he can. That knee support is there, not necessarily for him to rest on. He can if he needs to, but it's there in case he were to lose his... There you go. He's, so he can't go anywhere right now. He's totally... Um, stable and safe, I can be hands-free five feet away from him and don't have to worry about him having a fall. He can also use that as a rest. So as we look at here, we have the knee pad on. In this position, you can definitely start to, you can leave it static if they're lower level and you can do some different activities um, from this level, just having him reach with his hands, take one hand at a time, reach over, reach, touch my hand. There you go, back, reach, and come back. And I reach with your left arm way out here, reach way out, there you go. And then with your right arm way out here. 
if you wanted to, you could mimic him. He could take a book, reach, grab this book. You could start to make it a little more function, functional. You could be pretending he's grabbing that off of a shelf, put the book here on these other books, reach way out here, reach down here. You can have him reaching low, put the book over here. Then we could have him grab one from the other side, put it back over here. So another nice feature, if you don't want both of those, and depending on how much support the patient needs, it's going to be very true of all, a lot of residents and that they're just starting to stand again. And they've been immobile for a long time. They've been impaired in their wheelchair. and They need this amount of support. Here's another feature of the, of the Omni stand. This is tabletop. So this tabletop can be used um, for a variety of functions. It's easy to secure. Again, we went from basically no support in the ear to full support at the knee. And then up here, the patient could use this for extra upper extremity support if they need to. You could then work the patient um, to just using one extremity. You could have them reaching with one arm. and They still have the extra support here on the table. They could do the other arm, right? You could use that tabletop to set up other activities. Uh, in this case, we could have Joe likes to work around the house, so we could have him try to don a pair of gloves. So he's having to let go of the table, he's trying to maintain his balance, and he's doing something functional, right? You can be as creative as you want with this. You can take it, and then we can have him reach in. He likes to paint. So we're gonna have him dip the paintbrush into the paint can and then reach up and try to paint the corner of the wall up there. Very good. So you could have him do anything where incorporating some upper extremity movements. So before we go any further, as we talk about balance retraining, you want to vary the conditions to which someone is doing something, right? We can go from totally static, uh, full support, and then progress it along the way. So we can progress their base of support. So we can have their feet apart, together, tandem, single leg stance. Um, can't do a lot of that stuff with, we can do the feet together and apart with the knee pad to progress it to tandem stance and semi-tandem and things like that. Probably be a little more practical to take the knee pad off. Uh, we also could vary the support surface. Right now it's on a firm support surface. Uh, we could put any series of uh, balance pads or foam, foam rollers underneath him while he's standing there. We could do some of that while he's in the one step up. Okay. So you may have to have your patient sit to do that. Joe is pretty strong and higher level, so he's able to allow me to get that underneath his feet. And standing, so we've changed the support surface now. We could have him do some of those very same things with the with this locked in place. We could have him do some of those very same things, reach up and try to paint the corner of the wall. Okay, there you go. Now he's using less and less support as he goes. So we can tell him, don't hold on at all. I want one hand up, reaching up with the paintbrush. There you go. And over here. Maybe down the corner a little bit. There you go. So we got him reaching in all different directions. And he's fully supported, but now we've changed the, one of the conditions. We have him standing on foam. So if you've used your modified cat sit test, again, this is where some specificity comes in. Um, one, it does challenge his balance in general. Um, we'll add some strengthening components if you're using compliant surfaces, but it also skews that. Um, some amount of sensory input just enough to where you can force them to use some of the other senses that they that, that we have at our disposal, the visual, visual cues and or vestibular cues. All right, so you can use the tabletop, any kind of different activities you wanna do, you could have set up there at the tabletop. Um, we're gonna take this off again get into a few more activities. We're going to go back to the ankle strategy, I think, and demonstrate the ankle and the hip and the knee strategies. Right. 
So these things come off and on pretty easy. They don't take up a lot of time. So you can vary your conditions, vary the amount of support. Remember, you can also vary when the swing feature is engaged, and that allows him to move within the Omni stand. You can also change the amount of resistance, spring resistance, that is provided through the device itself. There's a spring tension mechanism down at the very bottom here. It's numbered one through six. The higher the number is, the more resistance that's provided through the device. So if you want to allow them, say six degrees of freedom, we move it up to the first hole. We want to give them a little bit more support because they've just been working in a static mode and now we're getting ready to move to a dynamic mode of training. So now we have, there's a little bit more resistance in here than if it was down at number one. So the device itself can provide some external resistance to the patient. Give them either more support or more resistance that you can utilize for them to perform strengthening exercises. So you could have him just lean back. Let's move back through your ankles. Not so much the trunk. Okay, stay nice and straight and just lean back, push back, or not through, there you go. Is that hard to push back with that amount of resistance? Mm -hmm. So it's offering a lot of resistance. So he's actually having to use some trunk as well just to match and, and overcome that resistance provided by the device. Lean forward. Okay, good. And then backwards again. You can apply some manual resistance to that. There you go, push me forward, push, push, push. There you go, pull back, all the way back, all the way back on your heels, all the way back, good. Push forward and pull back again. So you can apply manual resistance here. You can turn to the sides. You can start them off on the left side, push to the right, push, push, push. So work on some weight shifting here, pull to the left side and push. So not only do we have the resistance of the the spring mechanism in the Omni stand, but we also are offering him some manual resistance. I'm going to decrease the amount of resistance on him. This is going to make him feel like he's having to balance on his own a little bit more. It's not going to provide as much support. So he's going to have to have a little more control. You can see him moving a little bit easier here. Not only can we provide resistance manually uh, to the device, Using our hands, you can use their band. So if you want to have him weight shift to the left, there you go, and come back to the right. Weight shift to the left and to the right. We can also use this in the same manner we did for, for backwards. Go ahead and pull back. Good, and pull back. Good, pull back again. Good. So you can apply resistance to the patient's motions uh, through the device and externally. You can use a gate belt for that, something a little more rigid, a yoga strap, TheraBand. Um, we have him now in uh, 11 degrees of freedom. So we're gonna demonstrate because he's a little higher level how we can uh, get him to initiate some of those strategies. So. So if we do this ourselves, we are working with Joe at his ankle for the ankle strategy. Okay, go ahead and just stop in the middle. If we provide a little bit bigger perturbation, what we're gonna see is that he's gonna to start to engage at the, at the hip. So yeah, so you can, you can incorporate and, and get the patient to initiate these different strategies. Again, Joe has done this a couple of times, so he knows you may want to inform them which direction you're going at first, start out with some, uh, a little bit more gentle perturbations and then progress along the way. Um, the stepping strategy requires a pretty big uh, perturbation from you, the clinician. It's hard for us to do this outside the Omni stand. We're not gonna do a lot of pushing and pulling on the patients with that much force because we're afraid they may actually have a fall. I'm, I would be afraid of that if I wasn't in the Omni stand. Uh, one suggestion, if you do have the Omni stand and you have the, and you have the ramp, the attachment for the ramp, 
You put that in the front. This is going to work for the patient. It's going to give just a little bit of extra space if you can see. So you can take that. Go ahead and take a full step. There you go. You can also just practice taking a step if they have a gait impairment um, and they have trouble initiating their swing or they're ataxic. You can put some pieces of tape down there and have them do some targeting and just take them one, one step forward. There you go. I'm coming back. Step out again. Okay. So you may start them out like that. And that's a voluntary step, right? But we can also try to initiate a, an involuntary or reactionary stepping strategy by applying a more forceful perturbation. All right, Joe, so at some point, I'm going to go ahead and just give you a good push and see what you need to do or whatever you need to do to keep your balance. Okay, so that was a pretty good demonstration there. So you can actually do this with your with the patient without any fear that they're going to fall. Um, again, you just want to let them know what the plan is ahead of time and maybe have them initiate just some steps on their own at first, get used to the expectation, and then give them some smaller uh, perturbations and then gradually lead up to a more forceful perturbation that initiates that stepping strategy. Um, so we talked a little bit about ankle strategies, hip strategies, um, stepping strategies. We've, we've talked a little bit about varying the different environments that they are um, training in, varying the base of support, feet together. Uh, let's see how Joe does with his feet all the way together. Okay. And then we can vary also his amount of support. Joe, go ahead and cross your arms. Lift your head up, look straight at the screen. There you go. Right now, his eyes are open, firm surface, feet together, arms crossed. Then we get him to close his eyes. So that's kind of the one of the progressions that you can take someone through. Maximum stability is going to be firm surface feet apart, and then progressively more difficult to single leg stance. Arms could be out to the side at 90, 45, cross the chest. Again, progressively more difficult, eyes open, eyes closed. Okay, all of those things you can use in various combinations. And the one last thing we haven't done here that we did uh, prior was put Joe up on, on the foam surface to again, challenge him in that regard by changing, uh, varying the support surface. Foam, firm, different thicknesses of foam, foam roller versus a foam pad, foam balance beam. All these things you can utilize. Let's see if we can get Joe. Let's see if we can channel him. He's pretty steady. Um, we're going to have him stand in tandem fashion on this. There we go. He's going to get his balance. Head up at this TV screen. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. It's hard to challenge this guy, but he's not going to go anywhere. So you can see now he's getting some, some hip strategy in there. If we ask him to cross his arms over his chest, there you go, even a little more difficult. So we're getting some good ankle strategy here. We're getting some hip strategy. As he's just trying to maintain that center of mass over his base of support. He's at a level that should be showing you how we can take even our higher level patients and challenge them. So I understand that we have a lot of low level patients, but we also have higher level patients that we need to challenge. We could have Joe, now close his eyes. There you go. If you wanted to make it even more challenging, keep your eyes closed, Joe, and shake your head like you're saying no. You can see that he's handling that, but you can't see the extra sway. Open your eyes. You can see the extra sway, and you can see him fighting down the ankles and the hips to keep his balance. All those, utilizing several of those strategies that we need to have to maintain our balance. Go ahead and step off. You can turn this from the other direction. We're going to leave it off for now. Um, so again, we've maybe done our modified cat sib and, you know, found that he's pretty visually dependent. So maybe we do want to use the foam underneath him to kind of force use and for him to really be able, even though the information is skewed, that's going to challenge him to utilize that more. Or we do things with eyes closed on the firm surface. Um, we can also get him to do, maybe he has some 
If he's got problems, visual problems, maybe on condition one, firm surface, eyes open, he's having problems. We should be generally using vision, but if not, maybe he's got some gaze stabilization issues. So you could do some uh, times one viewing or gaze stabilization exercises or even some visual spotting gaze stabilization exercises. You want to hold up a little target. I just have a little pencil with an orange tip on it with the letter A on it about three feet away. And again, we can vary the conditions, firm surface, foam surface, feet together, tandem. You can make it as challenging as you want. Um, arms supported, arms across the chest. Right now, we're gonna put his arms across the chest. We're gonna have Joe look at that letter A because he's having some visual uh, deficits, has some gaze stability problems. Maybe he feels a little off balance or dizzy just when he's walking or when he's turning his head. That's telling you something, right? So maybe we correlate that with use of that modified cat sim test and we, we can guess that, okay, he's having some gaze stabilization problems. Uh, so let's do some work there. So he's looking at the letter A, he's gonna turn his head like he's saying no, shake his head left and right, a little bit faster. You wanna move in at about two hertz. Um, that's a pretty good clip, just like they're saying, just like someone is, is nodding their head no. A little faster. There you go. And after a minute of this, we're going to turn it so he stops, and then he's going to go up and down. Again, keeping his, it's only one object moving, his head. This is called times one viewing or gate. It's a gaze stabilization exercise. Okay. We can also do the times two viewing, which is when I move the target one way, Joe moves his head. He keeps his eyes on the target at all times, but moves his head in the opposite direction of the target. There you go. That's well times two. So again, you can make this as challenging as far as support surface, uh, base of support, arms, things like that, as, as challenging as you want and progress along the way. That's, called, that's another gain stabilization technique called times two viewing. Both objects are moving, his head and the target. Okay. Now that we can do both for... Um, Making, bringing him to the edges of his limits of stability and for some visual tracking uh, is to grab balls of varying size. Sometimes you might start out with a big beach ball, depending on the patient, and then progress yourself to smaller balls like a tennis ball. Um, and then right now we have this mobile, but it could be static again. And we're just going to toss the ball in all directions and let Joe catch it and throw it back to me. I've seen this a million times in the clinic, and there's usually two or three people standing next to the patient, and then one clinician tapping a balloon or throwing a ball. We're doing this hands-free, just Joe and I. We don't need any extra support. Granted, if he's lower level, you may need an extra pair of hands just to get him loaded in the device, into the Omni stand. But once they're in there and secure, you no longer are going to throw it lower now. There we go. So Joe is going to be able to really reach and lean and extend himself that we may not otherwise see him doing if there was no one there to support him if something were to happen. So one of the other things that we're incorporating here and talking and, and doing as far as progression, you know, we're, we're changing Joe from static to some dynamic motion. Now he's He's engaging his upper extremities too, which is going to add to the back, the postural challenges. Um, so that's an, always another progression that you use arms supported across the chest and then dynamically moving the arms, maybe even holding a weight or something in his hand. Say this was a weighted ball, I have a weighted ball here. So we give him some extra weight. He holds the ball out in front in both hands. His job is to keep his balance and he's going to just rotate side to side with his arms. There you go. So again, we're adding some upper extremity challenge uh, while he's moving dynamically. All right, let's take that ball back. You could do this on with lighter weights for your lower level patients. You can start them out using one hand in close to their body. As they get stronger, progress, farther out away from their body is, the more postural support they're gonna to have to have 
Also good for some trunk control, right? He's getting some rotation with that weight. Obviously, again, you can start out in here and do your rotation. You could use TheraBand or manual resistance for the trunk uh, if you were trying to incorporate some rotation. Um, I'm going to switch gears after I take this off. We are going to switch up hand strikes now we can do some uh, gait training uh, within this. Marching, you already saw how we can do some weight shifting, but we're going to make that a little bit more practical if you have the Omni VR. Uh, virtual reality is always going to add to your effectiveness of your outcomes. It typically engages the patients a lot more than just traditional exercises. Actually, we'll leave that locked. We'll show how you can incorporate some, some gate activities in here. Right? A lot of times, um, you whatever functional measure you use, the tug, um, the bird, if you use, use a DGI or functional gait assessment, right, we're picking up balance impairments that are going to lend itself to increased fall risk. So you can work on some gait. Uh, well, the patient's inside the Omni stand as well. Without the knee pad in place, he's going to be able to have fully move his hips and knees. And we're going to go to a stroll. All right, so we're going to set up Joe on the stroll. He's going to do, be doing some gait. Um, so again, single leg stance is another thing that we're looking at. So people always ask, why am I working on single leg stance? I don't stand on one foot. My response is, yes, you do every single time you walk. So if they say I don't need to stand on one leg and you choose to do some single leg stance activities in the Omni stand, um, just compare it to the fact that every single time that they walk, they are in a single leg stance for a certain amount of time. So it's important that they can that they have that ability that's going to add to their balance and decrease fall risk. So we're going to see Joe here. He's got full degrees of freedom. We could have it static. We have him at 11 degrees of freedom, so it's fully mobile. He's stopping for a red light. So we have some cognitive things going on here too. He's got to make that decision to stop. Otherwise, he's picking his feet up nice and high, walking down the path. You don't have to have the VR to do this. You can have someone march in place. I just personally like using um, the VR system and add something that gives the patient some other engagement. So, so a couple of other things that we can do, we're gonna show you, we're gonna kind of go back to show you how we can incorporate this on we stand for some use of his ankle and his hip strategies. So if we choose to do some a puzzle activity with uh, in standing with a lean. I'm going to put these here. And typically with the VR, this is trying, the trunk, they're trying to get a trunk lean, so you can use, utilize it like that. For him to work on ankle strategy, we're going to have him more leaning over the ankles versus bending at the trunk. Now, if he has to get a little extra trunk in to get the target, that's okay, but we want most of that motion coming through the ankles. So in the initial setup, you'll see he's going to be going right and left to place these puzzle pieces. And then we'll flip it around so you can get some uh, hip strategy. So here he's using ankle strategy to place the puzzle pieces. There you go. Again, you can apply some resistance while he's doing this activity. And he's dual tasking here too. He's having to figure out what, where the puzzle piece goes, which side of the screen it's on, then make that motor motion to go pick that puzzle piece up and, and, and get it done successfully. I'm gonna flip him around here. And the Omni stand is pretty mobile, although it's not a transportation device. We can use it with patients, but you just want to make sure it's in static, really, before you start to turn around. But you can bring them to another side of the gym. You can roll the Omni stand up to a, a kitchen cabinet and have them stand there and try to reach up to the cat in the kitchen cabinet if you have that type of setup in your gym. 
to put things away in the shelf or take things down. Have a lock back into place. We got them all locked in. Now we're going to see if we can't, if we got them in the right spot. Move your arms. There you go. Perfect. So also one of the things that I'm not sure if I touched on was you want to vary head position, right? We can have head movements um, when they're in static standing or when they're marching in place or walking side to side, up and down. That's going to get some good vestibular stimulation going on. Looking at that uh, linear acceleration, angular acceleration. So if we've done that modified cat sit and seen that they've had some, some issues with their vestibular system, integrating that information, and they, it's just hypofunctioning. They don't necessarily have a documented BPPD or Meniere's disease or something like that. It's just a hypofunctioning vestibular system, which is very common in the elderly. Um, those head movements are going to help. But here we're also going to just have him static, looking to the left at the screen. His body is still forward. And we're going to pick a puzzle piece. And now instead of side to side, he's going to use ankle strategy forward and back or hip strategy to get those pieces. Oh, hold on. That's uh, my error. I'm going to give him some freedom here. I'm not going to be as successful. We want him to use the ankle and the hip strategy. So we're going to give him some degrees of freedom. Hold on a second. We're going to make it just a little bit. I think that's good right there. Maybe right will give you a little bit more. Wave your arms, Joe. There you go. There you go. Through the ankles, or through the hips, I'm sorry. I want you to get that hip strategy this time. There you go. So he's doing a great job with, with activating that hip strategy, trying to get those puzzle pieces. But you'll notice, too, every so often, if that's not quite enough, he's going to engage that ankle strategy at the same time, which is a normal process. We use what we have available and the best resources available to keep our balance. So that's not a bad thing. That's a, that's a good thing to see. Thank you and Joe for another great presentation. And again, thanks everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate you. So if anything else comes up, um, please feel free to reach out to, again, ACP uh, Remote Clinical Services at 800 350-1100, option two, or uh, your clinical program consultant with ACP. Other than that, thank you again, guys, and everybody have a great, safe afternoon. All right. Have a good day. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody.